Good afternoon, everyone. It's lovely to see you all. And welcome to those of you who are joining us on live stream. Um, it's a real pleasure to welcome Dr. Simon Clark um, to our second of the Research Forum series online this term. Simon has been associated with the, the RNCM since 2003, which is a good few years now. And he is now deputy head of the graduate school after years of being a tutor in the academic studies. He is a philosopher, a composer, a guitarist and a musicologist. Um, his expertise obviously is in, in philosophy and in Derrida and Badiou, and we're going to be hearing about that today. Um, he's also got a great interest in French and German music of the early 20th century. And he's published fairly recently on Debussy in the Journal of the Royal Musical Association. He's also got an interest in Raval and has um, completed some orchestrations of Raval, notably the Miroir and the Violin Sonata, which he arranged for as a concerto. Um, Simon isn't going to play for us today, but he um, is, has an ensemble called Vulgar Display, uh, which combines extreme metal with French chamber music, a fascinating combination. And he collaborates with David Horn um, around um, Vulgar Display. They have given um, presentations and papers together. Um, today, he's going to be talking to us about From Here to Eternity, Badieu, and the imminence of truths. So please welcome Simon Clark. Oh, well, thank you very much, Barbara. That's very kind. Okay, and we'll begin with the uh, now ritualistic screen sharing. Okay, here we are. Hopefully all is well uh, with respect to this. So uh, uh, welcome very much to my uh, capacious office. Uh, I tend to prefer to stand uh, when I'm presenting, uh, so there was a little more room here, but even still, the jeopardy is at some point I'll probably trip. Uh, so let's look forward to that. Uh, but in the meantime, okay, so from here to eternity, Badu and the Imminence of Truths. If you've um, read the abstract, uh, then I should say that this is a slightly different version. Uh, so, actually, that's rather a good image, isn't it? There you have Badu uh, as a live action shot somehow. Excellent. Uh, for some reason, wearing a safari jacket. I'm not entirely sure why. But, so, uh, the idea was, I'm just going to minimise that slightly, uh, that uh, for the uh, Music and Philosophy Study Group at King's last year, I was invited to participate uh, in a panel, uh, the question for which uh, was, what is a musico-philosophical argument? It's actually what is a music philosophical argument, but that seems slightly odd, so I change it. Never mind. Okay, and so uh, that was a version, but I've modified it since uh, for uh, this occasion. Uh, and so the abstract, uh, whilst representative, uh, perhaps extends ideas beyond um, uh, uh, the reach of what I'm planning today. Okay. Uh, now, I chose rather to evade the question, uh, rather than actually take it on. Uh, this is something that uh, Socrates would disapprove of. I actually just gave an example of uh, a musico-philosophical argument, uh, instead of trying to uh, explore the idea in a broader sense. Okay, and so uh, Alain Badiou, of course, a contemporary philosopher, uh, and responsible for perhaps the most comprehensive system of philosophy of our time. Now I've emphasized that just because it's deeply unfashionable. Somehow there's something grandiose about uh, the old metaphysical systems and so forth. Uh, but he doesn't seem to be too concerned about that. So uh, the comprehensive sweep of his work somehow uh, and uh, its involvement potentially with music uh, makes it rather interesting, I would suggest. Okay, so even if contemporary philosophy uh, uh, in many of its guises, uh, is suspicious of the idea of a comprehensive system. Uh, Badiou has no qualms where greatness is concerned generally. He wants to ask the big questions uh, and he thinks we're cap uh, capable rather of greatness generally. Now it's probably worth my giving a little background where uh, Badiou is concerned just because sometimes, he isn't all that well known to everyone, 
Uh, he met, uh, I found this in fact, that he's confused in conversation uh, with Bourdieu, a very different thinker. And so uh, just a very brief introduction to Badiou before we launch into uh, the arguments proper. Okay, uh, there he is as a rather younger man. Okay, born in 19, uh, 1937 in French Morocco for what it's worth. Now, predictably, uh, if you know his work at all, uh, his uh, father uh, was actually a mathematician. His father was also uh, the mayor of Toulouse. So politics and maths are very much part of his upbringing, part of his background, and they figure very much in his work. Okay, he started at the Ecole Normale Supérieure, so he was a Normalia, very prestigious, uh, and as it happens, uh, under Louis Althusser, who of course was a structuralist, uh, one of the leading Marxists of the 20th century, a leading member of the French Communist Party as well, and this, uh, in one form or another, was very much influential on the young Badiou, who is very much associated with far-left politics. In particular, uh, he was mobilized by the riots across France in May 68. Uh, he even uh, forswore work in philosophy for a little while in order to pursue militancy. Uh, and he uh, garnered a reputation as a Maoist pitbull, which I think is fantastic, just as an expression. I mean, I can't really imagine a, I don't know, a, a Galian hamster or something. Maoist pitbull sounds really aggressive. Uh, and so well done him for that. Okay, now he's written voluminously, I mean really, 40 odd books, any number of articles, he's also a playwright, poet and so forth, uh, very, very productive. Uh, but his most important works, I think it's fair to say, are the following. So Theory of the Subject from 1982, that's his most trenchant Maoist statement, or far left statement. Uh, it's still connected to an extent with dialectical materialism. Uh, something that he uh, would distance himself from. Uh, but nonetheless, that's uh, late 70s, early 80s, that's very much uh, in the far left Maoist mode. Being an event, though, uh, is his masterwork, what he's most celebrated for, uh, and introduces uh, his now famous statement that mathematics is ontology, as in mathematics is the study of being. Um, this is couched in set theory. We're going to explore that uh, in a short time. Also, the notion of the event, and it's important in what follows that we understand that he's interested in rupture, in a radical change somehow, the, the absence somehow of totalization, reduction of difference to the same. It's the possibility of ruptural change that he's interested in, and so the event will become important uh, in due course. Uh, Logics of Worlds is actually being an event too, and uh, elaborates on ideas there, adds further detail, uh, further subtlety by way of what he calls an objective phenomenology, uh, and that derives from category theory. So it's all quite complicated in terms of uh, mathematical uh, reference. And then most recently, he completed this project. Uh, L'Emanence des Derrités uh, is being an event three. Uh, the reason I give the French title is that the translation hasn't appeared yet, so we've had to be laboring with the French version. Uh, and this reminds us that everything has been ordered around a conception of truth, uh, where Truth has become deeply, deeply worrisome for 20th century philosophers after Nietzsche. Uh, this is one lone voice in the dark who's very much committed to the idea that there is truth, although under certain very specific circumstances, as we'll see. Uh, I just thought he deserved a round of applause for completing this project, that's all. It's a, uh, hence the Python reference there. Okay, so. Uh, our concern today uh, is his reading of Wagner. We are going to have to situate it within his philosophy more generally, and we'll get to that. Uh, but it's uh, his engagement with Wagner that's our principal concern today. Okay, so we've already established that both system and truth are unfashionable, but he also wants to rehabilitate the idea of high art. Uh, which, especially in current political circumstances, current cultural circumstances, uh, would seem quite a questionable venture. Okay, uh, his engagement with art generally uh, primarily involves Mallarmé more than anyone else, but Wagner does um, uh, play a significant role, certainly, 
um, as we'll see. Okay, um, uh, much of this is actually derived from five lessons on Wagner from 2010. Okay, now, of course, uh, he's well aware of the political associations of Wagner, but also the political associations or the questionable elitism stroke imperialism of high art as a whole. The idea that there's some special tranche somehow of culture meant for the educated, for white uh, middle class men of a particular era somehow, uh, and that other music somehow are uh, disposable, short lived, meaningless, whatever it may be, not serious. Uh, but also very uh, dubious associations, perhaps at least, with high art in the sense of representing a certain era of imperialism and uh, the domination somehow of European thought, European culture, and so forth. Whether that's justified is another matter. Okay, so uh, any number of texts uh, on which he might have drawn, but in mind, in particular, he has Adorno and La Coupe Pâte. And drawing on their work, he draws up the charge sheet as follows. Okay, well, at least according to the caricature, this isn't difficult uh, to um, represent, I suppose, or it isn't difficult to access, uh, in that we know that uh, Wagner is famously associated rightly or wrongly, with proto-fascism, uh, with anti-Semitism and so forth, a very conservative view. He seems indicative somehow of a 19th century way of thinking that led to disastrous consequences in the 20th century. Uh, also backward looking because it seems to be pegged to the idea of creating a new mythology for itself. Okay, so perhaps that's a well-known charge. Okay, this is also uh, well known to readers of Adorno and students of uh, orchestration generally. The idea that there's uh, something excessive about the orchestration, phantasmagory, which uh, the quote here is appropriate, occults the means of production by way of the outward appearance of the product. In other words, it commodifies or reifies the music. The idea is somehow to give the sense that it's some seamless, timeless object somehow that wasn't created by labor and the investment of the individual musicians can't be heard because of the uh, the uh, obfuscation somehow of their work by the total effect. Uh, La Coupe uh, refers to it as amplification for what it's worth but it's a similar idea. Okay now this is really what's at stake more than anything else in what follows. Totalization. Now that's easy to see with the Gesamtkunstwerk, the whole idea of the total artwork, everything being integrated together somehow. But there's more here, the idea of it being consistent with the totalizing metaphysics of the likes of Hegel, these 19th century metaphysics which seek somehow to absorb everything into themselves in the aspiration towards absolute knowledge, that somehow if we draw back the veil on reality we find mind, we find thought. Uh, and so somehow the grandeur of this, and possibly the arrogance of it, the delusiveness of it somehow, that we can understand the absolute, the totality somehow, this is also what's at stake here. And in everything that we see from here, this will keep recurring. Uh, but it is rather fun. He notes that Wagner, like Hegel, stands as the boundary stone on which is engraved, here ends the project of high art, or here lies the last great metaphysics. Wagner stands as the big mausoleum in the graveyard of impossible grandeur, uh, which is memorable. Okay, this last one I think is more problematic, and certainly conversations I've had uh, with colleagues uh, on this subject uh, would seem uh, to confirm that. But where we were discussing the idea of resisting, uh, synthesizing somehow difference into the same, which is one way of reading Hegel, uh, the idea of endless melody synthesizing into itself the discontinuity of speech. So therefore, the sort of ruptural change and inconsistency of which speech is capable suddenly just becomes reduced into endless melody, so as to create this myth somehow of lived continuity of the subject. And the continuity of the subject is very much problematic for what it's worth. Okay. So, uh, a number of problems there. 
Just in case, though, we need an example, and it's uh, an opportunity, of course, uh, to uh, introduce a musical example, this is very well known. It needs little introduction as the Liebestod of uh, Tristan und Isolde, but it's the charge of totalization just to demonstrate that at least there may be some justification here. And this is something we were discussing in the PGR seminar uh, earlier today. Okay, in 1854, Wagner reads Schopenhauer and becomes an absolute devotee. And certain of his operas, including Tristan, are very much writings out of the subscription to that philosophy. Some of this is all well known, but all we need to grasp uh, here is that Schopenhauer subscribes to the distinction we find in Kant between phenomena and noumena. Phenomena are things as they appear, things in the world as we engage with them. Noumena are things in themselves, which is to say, as they actually are from no given perspective. But Schopenhauer criticizes Kant on the basis that, according to Kant, space and time are part of phenomena, the a priori intuitions for what it's worth. And Things in themselves on that basis can't be individuated. It's a thing in itself. It's a one-all. It's a monism. Being behind the veil, as it were, is unindividuated, undifferentiated. And writ large, across Tristan and Isolde, we have this sense that the phenomenal world is about suffering. Desire, which is caused by individuation, the delusion of being individuals, causes suffering. And this is what creates the narrative, as it were, a desire somehow to overcome that desire, to be returned, as finally happens at the end of the opera, to be returned to the one, to the undifferentiated realm of being, as it were, noumena, the thing in itself. Okay, and this is very easy to find in uh, uh, interpreting uh, Tristan, and this is actually what the Libre Sword is actually all about. If we follow uh, the libretto as it appears in the subtitles, we'll uh, uh, very much have this sense.
Okay, so maybe that was clear, maybe it wasn't, but uh, let's just affirm uh, what we have to say on this subject. Um, let me leave screen share just for a moment so that I can be seen. Okay, so uh, if individuality is on the side of phenomena and is something of an illusion and causes suffering through desire, this is the basic narrative that we have, the suffering of the individuals through their desire. But the only way to overcome suffering is to quell that desire, and at least, uh, at least in this reading of Schopenhauer, that is by returning to the noumenal realm, to the truth of things, which is to say, the one all of being beyond. Okay, and that's what uh, this idea, uh, I think uh, in that translation, it was the vast wave of the world's breath to drown, uh, often uh, actually translated as universe of the world's breath, which I think makes it clearer, but uh, never mind. Okay, let's return to screen sharing. Okay. So, back to Badiou and his reading of Wagner. So, he's recapitulating them, but uh, what we are to disagree with in Wagner is that he's mythic, technological, totalizing, and unifying. Okay, and much of the criticism is, of course, in the wake of Nazism, and both philosophy and art, according to some at least, are required to be much more modest, uh, much more modest, well, perhaps that too, but also modest. Okay, which is to say our ambition shouldn't be to grandeur, shouldn't be to totalizing, shouldn't be uh, to some sense of the absolute. No, we should be uh, concerned uh, with uh, finitude, uh, as they call it in philosophy, which is to say our limitations, recognizing that, that we aren't masters of all things. Okay, and so as a consequence, this again is Badiou's reading of both Adorno and Lacoulevard, the artwork has to remain open, informal, anti-totalizing, anti-essential, non-identical. Okay, uh, not much there will be unfamiliar, I don't suppose, as a reading of Wagner, whether it's fair it is another matter, but of course it isn't actually Badiou's uh, view, as we'll see. Okay, so Badiou still subscribes to the possibility of a high art, a high art in the future, and as he says, not as the aestheticization of totality, totality that he's opposing, uh, but rather only to the extent that it is uncoupled from totality. So, how might this work? Okay, this is where it becomes a little difficult from a philosophical perspective, but bear with me. Okay, so, uh, being an event famously declares that mathematics is ontology. Now, that might seem oddly formalist, certainly, but as a proposition, deeply questionable, even given the metaphysical role accorded to mathematics as far back as uh, in Plato. But mathematics is ontology, that's an extraordinary statement. Ontology is the study of being, if uh, anyone's uncertain. Mathematics is the study of being. Interesting. Okay, so the first question to ask uh, is what is he trying to avoid? What is he trying to renounce? What is it that in saying this that he's trying to counter? Okay, now this requires a little exposition. The normative power of the one, with a capital W. Okay, ideality is universal as identities. Let's retreat slightly and explain what we're getting at here. So, ontology is the study, ever since Aristotle, of being qua being. Being in the sense of being. Being as being. Being itself. Okay, and so uh, the question that ontology asks is, what is being? It also asks, what is a being? And we also need to differentiate, therefore, between the sense of there being being, with a capital B, with reference to no particular thing, and the beingness of beings, the beingness of individual things. We also ask, what is the meaning of being? And what do we mean by being? This is the realm of ontology, the study of being. Now, ordinarily, this isn't a question we ask ourselves every day. It doesn't seem uh, to serve too much of a purpose for us as we go about our lives. But it is first philosophy. It's an absolutely basic principle uh, in engaging with philosophy. 
Now, ordinarily, I'll put my remote control down. Ordinarily, uh, if we were to be asked, does this mug exist? Well, unless we're some sort of arch skeptic or arch idealist, we would probably conclude, yes, uh, without thinking really. But if we're then asked, what do we mean by exist? What do we understand by the word exist? So, well, something that is. And therein, we begin to find a problem. Is, of course, of just conjugating the verb to be. All we're doing is substituting the word exist for the word to be. That doesn't really help us too much. And in fact, we uh, quickly find uh, that if we do try to explain being more, all we find is a series of tautologies, uh, a substitution of words which mean the same thing. Uh, and as a consequence, it doesn't really help us. Okay, but from our perspective, if we don't want to retreat into antiquity, into Plato and Aristotle, we don't find it all that difficult to say, well, here, uh, various materials were assembled, they were molded into the shape of a mug, uh, and uh, we could easily melt it down again and it could be something else. What we're unlikely to do, at least many of us, is to imagine or to ascribe some sort of metaphysical essence that inheres, a metaphysical essence of mugness somehow, that inheres in this mug prior to its instantiation somehow in a material sense. Okay, uh, if you like something like the equivalent of a soul, that makes me sound like Monad, uh, 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 of Leibniz with respect to Monads and so forth, but uh, that's not really what I'm getting at. But nonetheless, something metaphysical that inheres within it, that seems unlikely from our perspective. And that's really what, uh, Adorn Adorn what Badiou is getting at with respect to identities. Okay, at the level of being, at the level of metaphysics, the identity of the mug is only material. Its being is another matter. So the power of the one, that somehow the identity of the mug is metaphysical, that's what he's resisting. But he still wants to be able to speak rationally of being, rather than just uh, consign it somehow to some poetic beyond, nothing can be said about being, so therefore let's not bother. No, he wants to be able to speak of it but without invoking the one. Bear in mind that the one here is, has a, a capital O on the basis that it could be the one all, the totality, or it could be these metaphysical identities. Okay, so the extraordinary thing that Badiou does is that he declares that the one is not. And at least according to a classical logic, that means that the only alternative is the multiple, the multiple is. Okay, but he's very careful here. A multiple is what is presented. It's the presentation rather than what is presented, so not the content of being. Okay, so he's, his ontology is about presentation. Okay, so... ...to be understood as counted as one. We count it as one thing. But yet, metaphysically, ontologically, it isn't actually one. Okay, and so what do we mean by multiple? What's this all about? A multiple is a set in the mathematical sense. Okay, this is set theory now. And a set operates rather like a Venn diagram. Okay, it's a collection of elements. But what we have to understand that all the elements that belong to this set are also themselves multiples. So therefore, each of them are sets as well, which contain other elements. And each of those elements are themselves multiples, sets which contain uh, other elements, and so forth. Okay, so at no point do you find an actual one. It's multiples all the way down. Okay, but the context in which they appear are known as situations or later worlds. These are themselves sets, and they're any discursive imposition or structure whatsoever, a structured multiplicity. Okay, so that could be absolutely anything whatsoever. That could be a country, it could be a book, it could be a room, uh, it could be uh, a theory, whatever else it may be. Anything that can be structured according to things that can be counted as one, this is going to be a situation. So two examples that Badiou himself uses, the French state and uh, Throw of the Dice by Mallarmé. So a poem, two things that are both situations. Okay, and they're determined by what counts as one within them, the things that are counted by it as belonging to them. Okay, and if the situation doesn't count something, it doesn't exist for it. And so the French state doesn't recognize what are called the sans-papier, the illegal workers, 
They don't count. They don't have a political presence. As far as the French state is concerned, they don't exist. Now, of course, they do exist, which is to say they have being, but they aren't counted as one in this situation. Okay. But what we have to remember here is that the count as one is only the result of an operation. It isn't actually the truth ontologically. Okay. Uh, and so it's as a result, it reminds us that inconsistent multiplicity, which is to say instability, something which isn't ordered, which isn't counted so uh, regularly, that actually haunts, as it were, the fact that the count as one for any situation is only ever borrowed. Okay, it only ever has a sort of temporary status, and it isn't the ontological truth, as it were. Okay, so there's a phantom of inconsistency or instability in any count as one. The count as one seems as if it's absolutely solid, but in fact, it's actually fragile. Okay, so there's one situation, just one, the ontological situation, which doesn't have that. It is itself the presentation of inconsistent multiplicity. It's the presentation of presentation itself. How, how presentation itself is structured. So this is ontology. Everything else is just borrowed, as it were, as a way of understanding what is counted within a situation. But in terms of ontology, all we have is the presentation of presentation. How does this work? Okay, the ontological situation is nothing. It's a theory of the void. It counts nothing. It's just a structure of counting, the rules for counting, nothing more. It is counting nothing. So from the void, from nothing whatsoever, ontology's compositions weave themselves without concept. So this is absolutely pure presentation of presentation. Okay, and to explain why that's important, it has to be a multiple of nothing. Whatever is at the bottom of this, of, the, of all these countings of multiples and multiples and multiples, it must be a multiple containing nothing. Because if it was a multiple of something, that something would then be in the position of the one. And it is necessary, therefore, that the axiomatic rules solely authorize compositions on the basis of this multiple of nothing, which is to say on the basis of the void. So the basis for this pure being is actually indistinguishable from nothing. This is actually a, a, a well-known philosophical figure that goes back to Hegel, of all people. Don't worry, we're almost at the end of this section before we return to Wagen, uh, but we're getting to the totalizing aspect. This is where it really becomes important. Okay, so in order to affix the rules for counting, for the presentation of presentation, there are nine axioms in set theory, known as ZFC set theory. Samalo Frankel with the axiom of choice. And it leads us to a startling conclusion. According to this, we can't establish a totality on pain of contradiction. Okay, so in order to explain how that works, it is slightly complicated, but it is very important. So this is very much the heart of what we have to say here. Okay, so theoretically at least, one of these sets should be able to belong to itself. So just imagine a set called sentences consisting of five words. That's also a sentence consisting of five words. So, uh, so it would theoretically belong to itself. Okay, so if we can establish that as a possibility, this is going to be abstract, uh, but let's try and follow it. Imagine a set and we're going to call it alpha. And imagine each of its elements are represented by beta. We can have beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, beta 4, and so forth, however many there are. Okay, so what if we try to form a subset? So that means group some of these beta together into a secondary set within the first. All those betas that don't belong to themselves. We just established the possibility of a set belonging to itself. So all those betas that don't belong to themselves. The question is, can gamma, which is this subset, can it also belong to alpha? And the answer is no. And this is quite straightforward. If gamma did belong to alpha, we would have to ask, does it belong to itself? 
If it did belong to itself, then it wouldn't be able to belong to itself because it's the subset of all those multiples that don't belong to themselves. If it didn't belong to itself, it would have to belong to itself because it's the subset of all those multiples that don't belong to themselves. In other words, it can't belong to alpha. Otherwise, it's a contradiction. So, just imagine then if we had a set of all sets, if we collected together all things in one totality, which is usually represented by phi or omega for what it's worth. Okay, if we perform the same operation, collect together all those multiples that don't belong to themselves, we would form a subset. And the subset couldn't belong to the totality of all sets without contradicting itself on precisely the same basis. So we'd have a set that doesn't belong to the totality of sets. You can't totalize them. There is no totality. That's what we were getting at all along. Rather long-winded, but there it is. OK, so finally we can move on from mathematics' ontology, but now we need to consider truth in Badu. OK, now, <laughs> this will seem particularly obscure, I'm certain. Um, those of you who are uh, children of the 80s, uh, like me, uh, this is one of the great 80s icons. This is Mr. T. Uh, hence, T is for truth. But the reason I include it here is that, so uh, last year, giving the aesthetics elective, I was giving uh, some of the lectures, Dave Bainbridge was giving others of them, and it just became a running theme. For no good reason, there would always be a reference to Mr. T. And uh, uh, after a few weeks, uh, a student who was, uh, I won't uh, name them, who was uh, from neither Europe nor America, said, in all earnestness, who is that man? So it was just a mysterious image that kept appearing, uh, causing uh, utter consternation, utter confusion. That's why uh, I include it here. So, T is for truth. Remember that all of this, uh, as far as Badiou is concerned, revolves around the possibility of truth. Okay, the emergence of truths. Uh, very unfashionable idea for most uh, continental philosophy in the 20th century, but very important to Badiou. Okay, now what we have to understand about truths is that they aren't transcendent. That means they don't pre-exist. There isn't some universe in which there are truths preordained by a god and we're just waiting to discover them. No, in particular situations, as a rupture, a truth may emerge, something completely new, unfamiliar, unfathomable to the inhabitants of that situation. It's something completely new. But once it has emerged as a truth, it's universal, eternal, and infinite. That means it can be revisited in any number of situations on an infinite basis, okay? worked through again and again and again. Okay? And the emergence of these truths are the events that we're talking about. A complete rupture in a situation emerging, in fact, from the void. Okay? They can't be grasped, they can't be understood by the inhabitants of the situation. Okay, the situation doesn't count it as one, that's the point. But those who are faithful to this emergent truth, who pursue its idea point by point, this new unfathomable possibility, okay, those who are faithful uh, do this. In actual fact, that's what he understands by a subject in a subject body, those who are prepared on the, the basis of faith to pursue a truth through to its conclusions. Okay, so much of the discussion we've just had of set theory emerges from uh, the 19th century in Georg uh, Cantor's work. Uh, he established that you could have multiple different sizes of infinity, but you can't prove it, it's just axiomatic. Uh, and so that requires fidelity to that to pursue its implications. Okay, another example of an eventual truth, Paris Commune, the emergence of a proletarian political consciousness. Now, of course, the French state didn't sanction that and crushed it, but those who were faithful to it were able to pursue it as a truth. Okay, and as it happens, Badiou believes that these truths emerge in accordance with four domains that he calls conditions. Mathematics, for which read science, poetry, for which read art in general, love, which extends to psychoanalysis, and politics. All of these are capable of generating truths in particular situations. Okay, so finally, we make our way back to Wagner. That's the time. Okay. So this is Badiou's defense 
of Wagner. Let's see what he has to say. Okay, in order to rehabilitate him totally, wholly, outright, Wagner would need to be an event for Badiou, a Wagner event in which truths or a truth emerged. Is there, in fact, a Wagner event, at least as far as Badiou reads it? Okay, so we recall the charges, mythology, technology or commodification, totalization and unification. Okay, now in reading this, most of it needs to be understood as Wagner refusing to collapse difference into sameness, to collapse difference into unity. So, Badiou claims at least that his resistance, except on certain notable occasions, to writing vocal ensembles was his resistance to subsuming different things into a unity, subjection of difference to finitude. Okay, Wagner refuses the totalizing implications of finitude in favor of the inconsistency of multiplicity and difference. Split, nonconformity, rupture, discontinuity. Okay, and for what it's worth, even though this should be really understood uh, with respect to number three here, he doesn't believe that Wagner is collapsing the discontinuity of speech into endless melody. He actually believes that Wagner's processes are primarily transformative, but there's a sense of rupture and discontinuity there, in fact. So he's actually rejecting the idea of a subject being consistent as a sort of lived continuity. In actual fact, the subject is split. In actual fact, the choices they make are difficult and they aren't the same throughout. And that's what he's getting at, subjective splitting. His great characters are split. They find themselves with impossible circumstances. They are more than one thing. They aren't unities. That's certainly so with respect to Tristan, his loyalty to King Mark on the one hand, and his desire for Isolde. Uh, the archetype here, Kundry, more than anything else, she laughed at Christ on the cross. On the one hand, she's this abject figure in Montsalvat, serving the Knights of the Grail. On the other, she's the arch seductress for Klingsor. Non-dialectizable split subjects, detotalized and cracked. Okay, this is interesting as well, because the typical charge ordinarily would be that however long Wagner's operas may be, they all aim at the uh, tonal reconciliation uh, for which we, or with which uh, we're familiar uh, across tonal forms. But in actual fact, Badiou feels that each opera had a very different hypothesis somehow, and it uh, took um, no little effort to find a solution. And ultimately, it may be that Wagner wasn't really happy with his solution. Okay, so we know uh, the turmoil of the ring cycle, which is to say, initially it was meant to be quasi-revolutionary, 1848 and so forth, and then supposedly became conservative and Schopenhauerian by the time it was finished. And yet both Badiou and Zizek for what it's worth, feel very strongly that the young Wagner, 1848, was far more proto-fascist, wanting a return to organic unity and far more anti-Semitic. And they both see a failure of the revolution, but there's a certain truth in that at the end of Goethe Demerung. They both feel that the hypothesis and the hesitation is very much there. For what it's worth, he has similar readings uh, for Meistersinger and Parsifal, specific to them, as it were. They have a very different hypothesis in each case, and he clearly hesitates as to how to resolve that problem. There is something detotalized and cracked about it. Okay, and most importantly of all, as far as Badiou is concerned, uh, the basis for figures of greatness uh, is a new concept of time. And this certainly rings true. You have the time of disparate worlds. Ordinarily, that simply means that we have those transitions that are so famous somehow, and you move from a very different mode or mood between one and the next, a different way of thinking, as it were. Um, but at uh, the time of tragic paradox, this really rings true. We can see it again and again, especially in the ring cycle. You have what's actually happening, which is to say the characters lie with their certain motifs, indicating uh, their psychology, their plans, their action, their character, whatever it may be. But always in the background, there are other references suggesting a different time, in conflict with the present somehow. That there is an arch, an arching reference somehow, meaning that the, the characters aren't necessarily in control. There's a split, a detotalizing in the time of these operas as well. Uh, Badiou's uh, example in particular uh, is 
uh, Hagen and Albrecht, for what it's worth, uh, in the first act of Goethe Dämmerung. We're going to see an example from Das Rheingold in a moment. Okay, so the name Wagner should, Ben, you would think, uh, given what we've said, stand for an event in its truth procedure, the detotalizing of the artwork. Uh, and he refers to it as heroism without heroism, uncoupled from totality. Okay, and this is something that you likes to say, living with an idea this way, this is the greatness of thought of which humanity is capable. All very exciting. Okay, so if he is to be defended here, it's because the name Wagner stands for a music that embraces multiplicity, denies the unity and primacy of subjective lived experience, is constitutionally open in refusing reconciliation, and conceives time by way of truths that are infinite and may be subjectivated, subjectivated anew infinitely across an infinite number of worlds. So let's give ourselves a short example of that because uh, this is probably in danger of overrunning. So uh, I'd like to thank uh, David Horn, our resident Wagnerian, for this example. Okay, it happens in scene four of Rheingold. It's shortly before uh, the entry into Valhalla and so forth. Okay, we have several uh, light motifs that we understand. They seem to refer to what uh, is going on. We know that the ring has been stolen from Ar Elbrick. We know that it's been given to Fasolt and Fafner. We know the murder takes place. Uh, there is deep concern about the curse on the ring in Votan's mind. And all of a sudden, we have the emergence of a theme that has no reference whatsoever and won't have any reference until uh, Die Valkyrie, for what it's worth, and then even greater resonance later on. And I suspect uh, David will have more to say on that uh, uh, during the questions. But the idea of the sword theme, which has no reference or relevance here whatsoever, suddenly Botan seems possessed by a thought, a possibility. It seems as if there's something lurking in the background, despite what's happening here. The sword theme doesn't make sense until the Valkyra, for what it's worth. Okay, so as it happens, though, uh, Madhu doesn't feel that Wagner quite makes the grade for an event and the truths that follow. It refers to it as a weak singularity, that's almost an event, but it doesn't quite transform the situation in which it emerges. Okay, and this is an interesting uh, couple of quotes here. It's been said that Wagner was an isolated case. It is paradoxical because Wagner's impact was enormous. But in another way, I think that in certain respects, it is true that he had no heirs. All the evidence for the contrary notwithstanding, Wagner still represents a music for the future. The most important thing for us is precisely that path, namely the possi that path, sorry, namely the possibility that he was the last to aspire to greatness, to dispensing with totality. This is what it's all about for him. Ah, I don't know why that's so that must be the wrong slide. What's going on there? Oh, never mind. That's another in joke. Uh, okay, well, I, I end there, so uh, over to Barbara. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Simon. We can all um, give give you a virtual or real clap. 
Um, thank you so much for your patience, actually, in talking us through some quite tricky concepts and actually making it possible to follow you. I, I did philosophy for two years at university in the in the Scottish system where people often juggled more subjects um, and it took me back in, in really interesting ways. So thank you for that wonderful um, clarity in, in your in the way you, you communicate. Um, there's, there's a lot to think about and, and the fact that you've related it to Wagner and to a very con sort of, um, familiar example in some ways um, makes it easier for, for colleagues here to, to ask you questions. So I would like to open it up to the, to the floor and see who would like to ask questions. If you're watching on YouTube, if you could email your questions to research at rncm.ac.uk, we will keep an eye on those, or I hope, um, I hope Tom can actually. <laughs> um, and um, we will feed them into, into the, I've got a thumbs up, that's kind, thank you, Tom. We'll feed them into the discussion you can put your questions into chat. I will do my best to follow that, but also put your hand up using the little icon. So I think we have some things in chat. So let's have a look. Okay, so there's comment from, um, we have a comment from Nick and Tawi. Do, does, do either of them want to ask a question? First question to Nick. No, I'm not that big a fool, Barbara. <laughs> okay, so who would like to go first? I'm, I'm happy to go first. Um, David. I'm, I'm always willing to make a fool of myself. Um, yeah, thanks, um, Simon. I, I think, as Barbara said, I, I really did appreciate the the explanation that I realised that had you been given a talk like this at a critical theory conference, <laughs> you'd have been probably kicked out of the room after 10 minutes. Um, but it was really helpful to me. Um, in my kind of very limited understanding of Badiou's event, um, as, as you kind of note yourself, you can't have a partial event. It either is all or nothing. And so I'm, I'm kind of wondering where um, Badiou's really coming from with this idea of the, the weak singularity and whether or not there's any kind of contradiction there. And then just a brief follow-up there. You will know that a lot of other people critique some of Badiou's events, examples that he gives, so the four main examples, um, 1968 you mentioned, and, and then other people have even talked about more recent events, um, 2011 London, for example. I'm just wondering if, if there's any contradiction in this idea that the event either is or isn't. And yet we can have, um, I don't know, a partial event in the case of the weak singularity. Yes, sure. Thank you. Um, uh, this is covered in, in Logics of Worlds for, for what it's worth. And so um, I think that was one of the criticisms of being an event uh, along those lines, that, that there was something slightly monolithic about it. And it didn't really allow for more gradual change or, or a, a gradation somehow of the possibility of, of there being some degree of change in a situation which he then uh, thereafter refers to as a world rather than a situation. Um, and so he allows for uh, four degrees, uh, modification which does very little, fact which changes a little, weak singularity. The, the technicality here is that every world has an, a proper inexistent. It's what defines the world by being what's excluded from it. Um, and to bring um, the inexistent out into the open somehow uh, is what constitutes something like an event. So it's emergence. But in order for it to be a full event, the inexistent needs to become maximally existent. So it needs to, it needs to be completely apparent. Um, and so th there's a gradation there. And so because he doesn't feel that Wagner's truths, the possibility of them, actually do have the impact they might have done, it was the inexistent as far as he's concerned, and it did emerge, but it hasn't been fulfilled or pursued. That's the idea. Okay, you know, thanks, that makes sense. If I've got time later, I'll come back to the, the sword theme, which I do think is really interesting from the, the point of view of an event, but people have their hands up already. Thank you, David. Um, can we have Dave, Dave Boombridge? <laughs> Um, so I was wondering um, if you'd care to speculate as to, uh, although Fred you's, um suggesting that there's no longer a case for a, a Wagner event, in as much as his events can unfold over an indiscriminate amount of time, um, 
is there a sense in which the, there could still be something to be pursued there that could be distinguished from the detotalization of the artwork um, after the atrocities of the 20th century in any case? What might that um, look like? And uh, could it be sustainable in any sense after uh, so both the political events of the 20th century, but also, uh, you know, say even thinking of um, something like the uh, philosophical objection to those same things on the basis of the rejection of Heidegger and so on, which uh, more and more has pushed people away from referencing his work. And um, Badu is similarly uh, uh, not enamored with talking about him on that basis. Yes, yeah, so very interesting. Um, um, I mean, the, the, the quote at the end there that, uh, um, that Wagner is still the music of the future uh, indicates that perhaps he, he's hopeful that it could still be realized, but perhaps on the basis that uh, he had in mind. Uh, I think it was uh, Francois Roger, uh, who's a, a colleague at ENS, or was, um, uh, of Badiou's. Uh, they ran various seminars, actually involving Zizek too, on Wagner. Um, and, and implications and so forth. And Roger seems uh, to be arguing that one of the problems for Badiou is that um, what uh, he reads in Wagner is actually a sort of retroaction of philosophy on Wagner. So rather than Wagner becoming a condition for philosophy, or at least for Badiou's philosophy, the problem is, uh, he uses an odd expression that it's upstream of the upstream, uh, the, the philosophy is having to come back to it in order to, to validate it. So uh, it's difficult. If an event, at least as uh, François Roger um, um, uh, seeks to define it, it, is something that conditions Badiou's philosophy, well, it may be too late on that basis. He's, he's quite elderly now. Uh, but if it can uh, condition others, well, perhaps there is uh, room for it. But uh, Badiou's own work is about detotalization. So you're right, it might, might have to be something other uh, in Wagner that could yet prove to have been an event. Thank you. Can we um, have a question from Devon, please? Hi, everyone. Hi, Simon. Um, thank you so much for giving that talk today. That was super interesting. Um, I guess you probably know because you are my supervisor. Um, but for people who don't, I, my research kind of focuses a lot on um, time and kind of conceptions of, of nothingness as well. Um, so I was really interested in maybe you could explain for you how Badu's eyes, um, ideas of these empty multiplicities, I guess, apply specifically to Wagner's music. Okay, well, uh, ordinarily, if we consider any Wagner opera to be a situation, then it would be a question of counting as one what's there. Um, but there would always be a void, which is to say there would always be something that it would overlook somehow. But the idea of the empty multiplicity is that, uh, just to clarify this, um, so uh, a given being multiple, actually it calls it a multiple being, uh, will be in several different worlds simultaneously. And it will appear with greater intensity in some, uh, lesser intensity in others, uh, in some it will be maximal intensity, in some it won't exist at all. Um, and however that works, uh, we're always, however, in set, as it's called uh, in mathematics, as in, so the ontological situation, every multiple is always in the ontological situation, but it's also in a number of different worlds and so forth. Um, and so, you know, as a, a silly example, I suppose, uh, in Valkyria, the Ride of the Valkyrie, uh, um, it, it's also in Apocalypse Now, <laughs> two different worlds, if you like. But one way or the other, if it is indeed a being, it's in set, it's in the ontological situation too. Great, thank you so much. Adam, Adam Swain. Thanks, Barbara, uh, and thanks, Simon. That was a fascinating talk, um, and I didn't have to Google too many words. I Googled most of the abstract, but um, the talk was super lucid and, and um, yeah, glorious. Now, I've got a question about this word rehabilitation, because um, you, you put it right at the top of the, of the talk, uh, rehabilitating Wagner. Now, of course, you linked it to um, uh, anti-Semitism and, and uh, atrocities of the 20th century, but I think it's fair to say that despite those things, Wagner has never fallen out of the uh, repertoire and remains very fashionable for lots of people. So I wonder what you mean by uh, rehabilitation. And um, I know that Badger said that he considers Wagner to be 
the one, so to speak, a one of a kind, a, a true, um, a, an isolated example of, of some of the things that you've been saying. But I wonder if you can think of any other composers that genuinely need rehabilitation and for whom these um, concepts might also apply to. Well, it's very interesting. Um, uh, I, I don't recall, I must be honest, uh, whether I introduced the word rehabilitation and I was paraphrasing him or whether that's precisely what he says. Um, and the other difficulty here is that Five Lessons on Wagner is only partially by Bedieu in the first place. But this is very odd. It's one of the few of his books to appear in English first. Uh, it was translated, I think, by uh, Susan Spitzer. Um, but she half wrote it as well. So it, it was um, drawn together from various different sources, lectures and so forth. And Bedieu was involved in that process. So he did authorise it in a certain sense, but even still, he didn't really write it. So uh, if, if it is from Five Lessons on Wagner, it could well be her word, and I just appropriated it unthinkingly. Um, but uh, certainly uh, the literature on which uh, Badiou's drawing, that is savagely critical of aspects of Wagner. Um, and so it may not be an inappropriate term, at least where Adorno and Lahu Labart are concerned. Uh, perhaps for others, you're right, perhaps it's inappropriate and there's no need to be thinking this way. Um, so I'll, I'll leave that question open, if that's okay. Uh, I don't know, um, in musical terms, who might also be need uh, uh, in need of rehabilitation. Gary Glitter? I mean, <laughs> uh, in philosophical terms, uh, Heidegger. Um, he's never disappeared, his influence has never really waned, but uh, his, his reputation is mud in some respects on similar bases now, association with the Nazis. Um, this is in, in, this is a big topic, isn't it? And it's one that that exercises and, and um, bothers people from from time to time. And certainly with Wagner during World War One, he was he was banned in France and um, for for certainly during the war. And it took a little while for that for him to come back in, but he absolutely did. Um, and London po it paused for a little while, but then got over their their worry about Wagner. But we've just had a some discussion in the in the chat about Wagner in Israel and the controversy of performing Wagner in orchestral form um, has caused in in that place um, there. So we've had Jane and David um, making some comments. Um, does anybody want to come in on that particular point or not? But um, no, okay, not at the moment, but um, it, it certainly sparked um, some debate here. Um, but thank you. So who has got their, their hand up? I've been told that somebody has, and I'm just not. Lynn, Lynn, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, please, it, it's, um, I'm the fool, Nick. It slightly goes back to Dave, what David was asking about, um, empty multiplicity or, or or because I'm my impression of Badiou's background was originally family was mathematical and um, in, in mathematics it's um, um, it's quite easy to it no no one one considers very often north of zero but I didn't hear you talk about the negative or the void very much now if you're a mathematician you can move the zero um, but ha so in application to Wagner, it makes me wonder or ask how much was Wagner or felt he was limited by your, our already existing tonal system if you can't move the zero? Well, uh, fascinating question. Um, moving the zero with respect to the void, uh, in ontological terms, that might be quite difficult to conceive. Um, and it should be said that, I mean, mathemat uh, mathematicians don't, uh, in my experience, they don't automatically um, enamour themselves of uh, Badiou or vice versa, and they, they aren't particularly uh, keen on his appropriation. There are, however, uh, exceptions. Um, but the, the, the idea of the void, what's really important, rather than the negative, is that it's, uh, the empty set uh, is, is necessarily to be found in any other set. And so it's something like the negation uh, of uh, of any set that may be found because it, it has no predicate, so there's no way in which you can rule it out. Um, but um, what was the second? Was was he usually then influenced by Sartre? Uh, yes, um, uh, but in opposition to him. Oh. Um, and uh, in opposition, so the 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 more. Um, 
avowed his opposition to someone, you can see the more uh, the more influence he is by them. So Sartre is one of them, um, and Deleuze. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Can we, Keith? You've had your hand up. Thanks. Um, very interesting and clear talk, Simon. Thanks. Um, there is only one thing I didn't quite understand or wanted to clarify with you. I think you said um, that it's taken as axiomatic that there are different sizes of infinity. But uh, Cantor famously offered diagonal proofs in the derivation of the transfinite cardinals. So I wondered whether you had anything to add. Yes, it's true that, uh, um, so we were explaining something like Russell's paradox there, and it is derived from diagonalization. It's just a slightly more complex, uh, complex way of, of presenting it. Um, but uh, you have the uh, axiom of infinity, certainly amongst uh, ZFC and so forth. Um, and Badiou himself does um, uh, discuss this at, at some length, uh, that uh, there are some who won't accept, if they're intuitionists, for example, they won't accept that there can be a, a limit cardinal that way. Um, so, in some senses, one has to be uh, faithful to the truth of the Cantor event. Thanks. I wonder if David wants to ask his question about the sword theme. Oh, no, I, I, look, I just love talking about Wagner, so I was just going to witter on about it. I mean, it wasn't really a question. Um, it was just that um, Simon had asked for examples, and I needed to actually understand more about what do you meant by the events? So, I mean, Simon can talk at more length, but it was also about um, disruption of time. And and so what strikes me about the use of the sword theme in at the end of Death Angle is exactly that, that it disrupts time. We don't know what it's about. And um, Simon says, of course, that Votan suddenly looks like he's surprised. That's what the stage directions as well say. Um, someone's typing very, very loudly, by the way. Um, so what happens is it's it, disrupting time we don't know what it means until Die Valkyrie. And um, it's also interesting that the opening of Die Valkyrie, he then quotes the Donner theme, uh, which of course you don't know what it means unless you've heard the then of Das Reingold. And I was just struck that in the history of the narrative of opera, this idea of suddenly having um, this event, pardon the pun, um, which actually disrupts time, we don't know what it means. It's very striking, you know, but yet it's meaningless. That That to me seems, if, if music can have an event, um, it's it's close to an event. Um, it's actually a little bit more plausible for me than um, something else that Badiou refers to, which is um, Schoenberg's use of um, 12 tone or composing with 12 tones. Sorry. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, uh, curiously, I think ultimately uh, Badiou uh, and his interlocutor, uh, interlocutors uh, conclude that the, ultimately there wasn't a Schoenberg event. Uh, even though it, gave, it seems to be a paradigmatic example in Logics of Worlds. Um, but it's an argument worth having. But as you rightly point out, uh, these examples of events, well, actually, we can argue about them uh, a great deal. But that's the idea of fidelity to an emergent truth, because it isn't demonstrably a truth. I think we have a question from Michel who wants to bring up the, the recent Schenker controversy. Yeah, I mean, yeah, thanks, Simon. Absolutely fascinating and, you know, really impressive. This is this is not a field I know a lot about and I learn a lot from you. Um, yeah, I mean, it was just I was just thinking these questions that we're talking about in the conversation, the chat around, um, you know, critical stances and, and how that might impact on music and scholarship and research. And, you know, I, I was absolutely glued to the controversy that unfolded over summer around Schenker studies. Um, and Schenker's own political views and, and, and racist views, many would say, and there seems to be good evidence for. Um, and I just wondered, Simon, whether you think that, you know, what that debate adds anything to your thoughts? Well, thank you. Uh, it, it certainly, well, um, debates like that, uh, certainly uh, in my thoughts. And so the idea of, of truth, this is why it's deeply unfashionable, you know, post-structuralist um, uh, perhaps that era has passed slightly, but uh, they certainly were, were looking somehow for not cultural relativism exactly, but recognizing that um, a truth was, you may have heard of a, a coherence theory of truth, that it's kind of what makes sense here, uh, rather than something being absolutely true uh, um, uh, for all peoples under all circumstances. So it's a slight concern in Badiou certainly that once this truth has emerged, uh, it's then universal and eternal and you know, true in all situations. 
Um, and just imagine then, uh, if uh, he felt that Schenker had been an event, well, that, that would cause some controversy, wouldn't it, on that basis? Um, so yes, it's very much an issue. But one thing I will say is that whatever the nature of contemporary debates, uh, we, we never really know how the future will look back on our own discourses either. So to imagine that we found a truth here in, in, uh, in the values that we uphold generally at the moment, or, or uh, very often uh, find ourselves campaigning for, that all, always has to be tempered by a certain concern for, for um, um, being a little over-emphatic even with what we believe now. Thank you. That's... Um... Uh, interesting, interesting question that that sort of relates to our our own current um, time. Um, do we have any more questions? Who would like to to ask one? I'm sure there must be a few more before we go to the virtual bar. Can I see any hands up? I can't see everyone on the same screen. I would love to know the Kermit story if we've got time. Um, it, well, there, there's something like a Kermit event in my life. Uh, I don't know how to express this. <laughs> uh, he does seem to figure a great deal in, in what I do. Um, and uh, it's also, there, there are a series of uh, ongoing uh, jokes with Dave because it's been my GTA for various courses. And so, so certain, uh, shall we say, pop cultural references kept recurring um, at, beyond that. And uh, also a Kermit in Family Guy giving the, the Taken speech. I, somehow it's worked its way into into our own private culture, what can I say? So he figures a great deal, but uh, I didn't know what to say. Thanks for sharing that with us in the, in the, the research forum. I, I like that slide. Um, so I'm wondering whether we have a, a few more chance. David, Dave, sorry, Dave Bainbridge, do you want to ask something? Yeah, so it was um, just kind of following on from Michelle's first question, not the one about Kermit, though, um, you know, I'd, I'd love to hear you do the Kermit taken speech um, if there's time. Um, so it was just whether, um, uh, I suppose, whether you'd like to elaborate uh, on or offer an opinion on uh, Badu's ethics in this sense, uh, as in particularly his, um, his book, Ethics, um, in which certain of these uh, issues, you might understand them to be circumvented in as much as he does have a very clear ethical position, um, which is the, continu the continuous revolution of the world against these uh, sequence of states which um, operate them. The idea being that uh, there's always some kind of movement uh, of the obscured into a position of uh, being brought into the world and so it's not as such that there's a movement towards the end of history because of this untotalizability but does this to any extent circumvent some of these problems uh, that we're discussing and uh, does Badiou have a, a way out of this as it were? Well I'm not sure he has a way out but um, I'm concerned that uh, many of his views wouldn't be particularly fashionable in that so there was a, a reference in the slides that I didn't actually read uh, to democratic materialism. Uh, and uh, many of the debates that uh, are, are raging, and rightly so, uh, at the moment would conform to what he would dismiss as debates about bodies and languages, I suspect. Um, so as we know, he proclaims in uh, Logics of Worlds that um, just according to a certain era of philosophy, there are only bodies and languages, but he adds, except there are truths. And as I recall, his ex uh, ethical maxim, if there is one, is that the, the, the evil is not, is not following a truth through. Um, and so that rather sets him against the tone, I would think, of many of the uh, debates about identity uh, with respect to uh, representation, culture, difference, and so forth in that sense. And yet, of course, untotalizability necessarily means not collapsing difference to the same. So there's potential for something there, but uh, he's, he's not without uh, um, a history of controversy. And one wonders if sometimes his statements are, uh, are over emphatic in order. But don't forget that as, for much of his life, he was a deeply unfashionable 
philosopher who suddenly uh, later in life found himself at the center of attention in that he was the outlier. Everyone else, certainly in France, uh, was very much consumed by uh, post-structuralism and so forth, the likes of uh, Derrida, the likes of Foucault, the likes of Deleuze and so forth. And he was the only one militantly maintaining not only outright commitment uh, to communism, um, but to truth as well. Um, so that militant streak probably doesn't always represent his uh, his thought as faithfully uh, as it might do. But I'm not sure discourses of bodies and language um, uh, are consistent with the way that he thinks, given that he opposes democratic materialism. Thank you. Any any more comments? Um, on a completely different level, Adam thinks that Adam Swain thinks we have just learned a truth in in hearing about the Kermit. So, um, but that takes us back to a slightly different level, but thank you, Adam, for that. Um, I think we're coming to the end of this bit, and I would like to invite you in, in a minute, if you'd like to come to the, the virtual bar. Um, so after a few minutes break, but before we do that, to thank Simon for, for having taught all of us something today, um, for the beautiful clarity of his argument, and, and for really um, challenging us to think in, in ways that are, are not perhaps so familiar to, to many of us as, as um, primarily focusing in on, on music in, in this way. But thank you for that and thank you for relating it to, to Wagner and, and for the discussion. Um, and um, it's delightful that you were able to give this, this second um, research forum lecture and before we 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 say goodbye to everyone just to say that next week's research forum is going to be given by Trond Reinholsen composer who's based at the Norwegian Academy of Music and he'll be joining us virtually to talk I don't have the title of his talk um, to hand um, but it should be a really interesting session so um, thank you for coming today thank you Simon and thank you to all of you, because it isn't a research forum without us all here around this virtual table. If you do want to come back, come back in about three minutes time when you've had a chance to, to jump up and down on the spot and let's have a more informal discussion at our virtual bar. Bye bye and thank you. <laughs>